I've been traveling America filming um, many television shows and had some very interesting circumstances that's happened to me over many of those years. Now, let me say, I've met wonderful, great people, you two amongst those people, but I've also had some very challenging, extenuating circumstances that have led me to uh, question my my existence, to be honest. Um, I'm very aware that I'm an outsider coming in, right? Um, so I wanted to get an insider perspective of what my outsider perspective is so we can honor the breadth of, of the realities that we're all living in at, at the present moment. And I'm tired of it. I'm honored to have Mr. Rodney Scott, Mr. Matt Horn. Rodney Scott's his home base is Charleston, South Carolina. He's now expanded his restaurant portfolio in many parts of America. My homie Matt Horn uh, is in the Bay Area. He's popped open his shop just very recently. So my brother Rodney Scott, let's start with you. Uh, you are the first black barbecue person to win a James Beard Award. You are a nominee of the Barbecue Hall of Fame. Um, so I will praise you with accolades and I know you to be a very humble man, but please give us a little context of, of who you are for people who just aren't aware of, of the legacy that you stand on and, and the greatness that you represent. Basically, I come from a tiny town. I'm, I'm just your normal country boy, you know, born in the city, but raised in the South. I'm just a country boy with a lot of hopes and dreams and, and doing my best to live them out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now I want to touch on Matt Horn, a new school barbecue legend representing the West Coast, right? So we're in the Bay Area, uh, we're in Oakland. Um, the the pop-up started there where, you know, we were doing a farmer's market for about six to eight months. And that was literally my first time selling my product to the public. Rodney knows this, everybody knows this, that barbecue is a labor of love. A lot of people think you're just in the backyard with flip-flops on. <laughs> yeah. you know, my wife, she was just kind of like, okay, you know what? I'm with you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to rock with you. Mm -hmm. I just told her, I said, just, let's just trust the process. As long as we don't cut corners with what we're doing and we are intentional with the excellence that we're trying to put into our barbecue, people will start to realize that. If you go, if you're in New York and you say, yo, let's have a barbecue, that means as long as there's any kind of fire, it can come from propane, it can come from charcoal, it can come from wood, and they could be putting seafood on there, they could be putting chicken, ribs, hog, steak, in Canada too, and, and in the North, that's barbecue, right? If you go to Charleston and you say, I want barbecue, and they give you something that's like seafood, they're like, what are you doing? So just addressing that, that we recognize that barbecue, grilling, and smoking are three completely different things. Why I brought you two together is because Rodney comes from a very interesting place in South Carolina. As you know, South Carolina, uh, post abolishing slavery, uh, South Carolina was still a hub regionally for trading slaves post abolition of slavery. And it went on for, you know, half a century, basically, uh, as, as a major, major hub. And there's still an old slave market on Chalmers Street. Uh, that's not so far from where Rodney's shop is today, um, where they were still trading slaves. And, and, and so, and in the West Coast, the trajectory of that was, was a little bit different. And to get that that sense of the lineage that Rodney is standing on and the lineage that that you Matt are standing on are different but also one of the same right oh man you know like you said right down the street from one of the the, the major trading slave trading spots it's it, it's deep down there man you know a lot of people come to Charleston for the history so and you know in the south the plantations have been transformed into like nice parks or places to have weddings and like events and blah, 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 blah. But I'm walking on the plantation. I see one of these big hanging trees and I'm looking going, wow, man, I can just imagine. I see the house there and I can just, it just, it, it ruined me to be standing there kind of perpetuating this, this glossy storytelling. And it really ate me up inside as an outsider 
looking in. So I love to get your, I love how your perspective is like, yo, you're down the street from that to this very day, but you walk on that with pride. To be doing, to be on a famous street in Charleston, cooking barbecue as a, a, a black man in a city that was once known for slave trade, for me, uh, it's amazing. It's a great feeling to, to bring it from a different level, to, to, to share it with other generations, to give youngsters more hope that we, we can do anything that we want to do. One thing that I do understand is that I do stand on the shoulders of those that have come before me, right? And then also, if there's no Rodney Scott, there's no Matt Horn. The reason why I say that is because he set an example as a chef and pit master to where when I see myself doing what I'm doing, um, he makes it, he makes it the reality possible. Like, hey, you know what? I can accomplish this. He's been able to do it because he looks like me. I always remember that in everything that I do, it's not just about Matt Horn or Horn Barbecue. I have a responsibility to the next generation. That's how we continue to, to protect and preserve our culture and the Southern food and also barbecue. As public figures, and particularly as black public figures, there's an additional responsibility as you walk and maneuver in the media landscape that's predominantly not black, right? You represent all black people. <laughs> we don't have a choice. It's set upon us that we bear that responsibility for the entire community that is not a monolith, which makes it also doubly challenging. So I find it's interesting that you say you feel the responsibility of holding the weight for the next generation. You know what? When I started earlier on, I was like, I have this passion, I'm committed, I'm dedicated, I'm obsessed with making this product the best that I can make it. I was, uh, my wife was asleep, I was downstairs, I was on my laptop, came across an article, this article is talking about black pitmasters being left out of the whole barbecue um, revolution and that's, that's taking place in America, right? And I read that article, and when I got to the end of the article, I literally were in tears. I was in tears because what it made me realize is, is that there was hundreds of, I mean thousands, I mean hundreds of thousands of individuals that came before me that the, this was their food way. This was a part of our culture. This is what they had to do to survive. This is why they're cooking the food the way they're doing. Yep. That right there is what made me realize my why and barbecue that evening right there. Because before I knew what I was doing, I was cooking barbecue. I was just trying to make some really great barbecue for everybody to enjoy. Yeah, yeah, At yeah. that moment, that's where I understood the why. So that's why I say that I understand the, I, I feel the sense of responsibility because it doesn't feel right. It's like, I have to pay homage to those that come before me. Taking it one step further, as we talk about the, the, the responsibility of the black public figure. So many people watch what we do. So many people pay very, very close attention to you. My man Nick tells me all the time, he says, the more you're out there, the bigger the target gets on your back. Well, you know, they come <laughs> after you. They, they try to get you on every little thing. You know, I get all kind of challenges and, and come thrown my way all the time. But the one challenge that I always win is I smile. There's a, there's a kind of a cumulative pressure around that, right? You have to kind of suppress your anger, get to a good place mentally, and then pass that good thing on to the next generation. So the second that me or Rodney, um, we get upset and we go off and we voice our opinion and we let our frustrations and our emotions get the best of us, now it's just kind of like, oh, they don't know how to maintain their composure. Oh, they don't well, know not only that, not only that, it goes one step further. You are now the angry black man. Exactly. There it is. It's a very there different it thing. It's a very different thing. My yep. brother, who I love very deeply, Bill Durney, if he goes off, he's just I got a bad day. But if we go off, yeah. you, know, you are the uh, angry black man. And that's the same thing that, you know, our sister yep. Kamala Harris has to deal, we're gonna be dealing with coming in. She's gonna be the angry black woman every time she does something that somebody else doesn't like, right? And that's the whole point of this, is that there's just other layers to it. There's other right. layers to right. how you maintain the composure. Because my brother, I do not maintain my composure all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's crazy you bring that up. And you know, Matt, again, we, we have this, this, this responsibility. 
I just had this conversation with my kid two days ago. He, he often asked me, well, why don't you ever get mad about it? I said, it does anger me, but I don't let them see it. You, you keep the calm attitude because he who angers you controls you. And if you stay in control of you, you'll never get in trouble. And we have to do it with a smile because at the end of the day, um, it's still Rodney Scott barbecue. It's still Horn barbecue. And the thing about it is these legacies and these businesses that we're building, all that work that's been put in to just get to this place of where we are and where we're going, we have to protect that. So then we have to exercise um, composure on a whole other level from what other people may have to deal with. I, I face the very same thing in context. I'm not cooking barbecue every day like y'all. I'm coming to visit y'all cooking barbecue every day, right? You know, my first time in Dallas, I had a dude, my very first time in Dallas, like a dozen years ago, a dude tell me, we got guns out here, boy. I, I've been in locations where dudes tell me, you should be swinging from that tree by a rope. I had people tell it like just I could tell you stories upon stories upon stories and I could either react and end up dead, literally, or I could go about my business, keep it moving, try to stay very positive. People don't know that. They don't see that. They don't know the maneuvers and the protocols that we're doing to make sure that not only I stay safe from my team, production and broadcaster layer, but how we have to maneuver just to get in and out and continue just trying to feed our families, <laughs> right? Yeah. Where do we go from here? You know, we talked about the history, the lineage, what we're standing on, where we are in a time and place now. After the context of this whole conversation for you to express what's next, where do we go and what do you hope for? You know, I got to say this, and I'm going to say this very slowly so you can hear me and understand me and everybody that can hear me understands this. What's next is the conversation. I'm going to say that again. What's next is the conversation. This, this, this issue of prejudging people can slowly disappear. I mean, Bourdain said it best. Barbecue is the beginning of world peace. I think I'm paraphrasing. But <laughs> you, you, you get what I'm saying. You know, we, we, we're in these, these positions where we can say, let's have a conversation. Let, let me explain to you where I come from. And you tell me where you come from. Keep our kids understanding keep ourselves understanding each other, that it won't be so much negative talk towards the black versus the white or whatever, the minorities versus the, the, the whoever's, you know, I think we'll have a better understanding and the world will be a much better place. If you're not aware of the James Beard Award, it is the most coveted culinary award in America. Traditionally, over, over the years, it has been extremely Eurocentric, very specific to fine dining techniques that were Eurocentric cooking techniques and white linens and China tablecloths, da, 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 right? Over the years, it's changing. And one of the fulcrums of that was 2018 with Rodney Scott, the very first black barbecue person to ever win a James Beard Award. You know, why, why, for the record, Rodney was there sipping champagne. He didn't even know he was the first black person to get it. <laughs> no clue. The, the nerves, the nerves were so bad. And then when they started to tell me that you just made history, e immediately, man, it was like, humble yourself. You, I need to sit down. I really need to gather myself. Mm. And to this very day, I have yet to gather myself. That's and you know what's, what's awesome is that you had that moment. But then Matt had his moment. So Matt, I want you to finish what your mo experience of that moment was, because it's the exact same moment, right? Yeah, when I yeah when I saw him go up there, he had his text on, he went up and he won, and I saw that. He went up and gave his speech, and I was watching. I was in tears. I was. I had never met. I had never met you, Rodney. I was in. I was at at my home crying like a baby. I, I looked at my wife, I'm, I'm in tears, and she's, she's smiling and enjoying the moment. And what I saw in that moment was, is that this man is being recognized for his hard work and for his dedication to his craft. And now the world is recognizing that this isn't just some, you know, backyard thing that we're just doing on the weekend. This, there's a commitment to it, and there's an uh, excellence that's in it. 
But then also it was evidence that those that have come before us, that their influence on this, they can feel on that too. Now it really like touched me in my heart. Because it's proof, it's a testament to the proof that we represent our community. It's not just, oh, Rodney won, cool. It's like, yo, we won. <laughs> yeah. like, it, it just yeah. is a proof and the test that it brought you to tears. So it's powerful, man. You know, I just want to thank you all for your for your honesty. Your earnesty is just of utmost greatness and importance to me. I, I really hold it dear and I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I want to thank you, you both, you know, those earlier days when I was not making any money. Um, barbecue was my only thing to kind of keep my hope. My wife was working. I was not. I was at home with a little baby. And I had to try to hold on to that hope. And this show would come onto the TV, this man fire food, and I would see this brother going on there, going to all these different spots with just his beautiful personality and energy and whatnot. And I was like, man, I love this show, man. I was like, man, this is awesome. I told my wife, I was just like, man, maybe one day we'll, you know, maybe one day we'll be on there or whatnot. And then I was blessed to be able to meet this brother. And we did what we did and we shot and I'm grateful to know you. So thank you, man. I I, I say that sincerely uh, to you both. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank man. you. Thank you, man. Thank you.